from there. Been the great mystery of Vancouver this week. Welcome to episode six of the Hockey Podcast. It is I, Kevin Olenek. You can follow me at K E V O L E at podcast underscore hockey. Add me as a friend on Facebook, Kevin Olenek, or like the Hockey Podcast on Facebook as well. SoundCloud, K E V O L E. Spreaker, K E V O L E. YouTube, Kevin Olenek. As mentioned, it has been the great mystery of Vancouver this week. Hence the Pink Panther theme, I figured it fit well. After 15 seasons on the ice and four seasons as president of the Vancouver Canucks, Trevor Linden is out of the Canucks organization. He is one of the most popular players to ever wear the Canuck jersey, not just on the ice, but off the ice. His work in the city and Vancouver has touched the hearts of many. The stories are legendary. That announcement was made at 5 o'clock Pacific time, in a press release on Wednesday. It is Rock Canuck Nation. And naturally, naturally, the right thing to do if the president of your organization is, of course, to have the owner of the organization do a press conference, right? I have no idea. That would be a question that you would have to ask, Francesco. Um, Nope. No word from Francesco Aquilini. What we heard is from general manager Jim Benning, head coach Trevor Green, Travis Green, in a hastily planned phone conference yesterday. So where are we now? What after the unpacked, somewhat couple of days of unpacked mystery? What do we know about the Canucks? What do we know about Trevor Linden? And is there, quite frankly, any confidence right now in the Vancouver Canuck organization that it can actually develop a competent team? And who actually is, are they actually going to have a president? Or did Jim Benning subtly this week, and I didn't get that clip, claim that he is actually the president? We're going to attempt to answer all of these questions with coming back for another bite of this is Sean Holmes Smith, Beardy Cook. How's it going? I'm good, thanks. How are you? Great, great. Thank you. And back for the second time, we did not get him last time, is uh, Tyler Noble. How are you out there? Uh, great, Kevin. Thank you very much. Yeah, sorry I couldn't uh, be part of the initial reaction the, the other day, but uh, happy to be with you guys again. Well, let's start with you. Let's get your. What was your instant reaction when you heard the news on Wednesday and where we're at now? Uh, well, mostly surprised. Uh, the timing in particular was was, uh, was a shock for me. I, I'm not surprised that Trevor Linden would get tired of this role at some point. Uh, for years, it seemed like he was being begged by fans uh, to get back involved in the organization and 
and, in some fashion and, and try and help push uh, push the team towards the promised land. And when he uh, took up the offer to to be the president of hockey operations, uh, you know, he looked rejuvenated. He looked he looked uh, excited and ready finally for the role, and you know was was seemingly doing it to get his hands on that Stanley Cup that he couldn't do so in 1994. But, uh, I mean, he sure, he sure looked like he's aged over the last few years. And, uh, I don't know, there, there was the stuff from Ed, Elliot Friedman there, uh, around the trade deadline and, and all the flack that, uh, a guy in Trevor Linden's role would have to take, uh, in a Canadian market, you know, that would get tiring after a while. Of course, what's so mysterious is just, you know, what exactly happened. And, uh, you mentioned, uh, how it's, you know, it comes out late afternoon, uh, press release, you know, no press conference. I mean, that's the style of, of uh, you know, an organization trying to dump bad news and, you know, get it over with quickly. So, um, you know, it's just, the split was described as amicable, but, I mean, obviously there was some kind of fundamental major disagreement that would have uh, pushed Trevor into saying, I've had enough. So I don't know where we go from here, but uh, it's... Um, Definitely a, a big surprise, especially with the timing, as I mentioned earlier, just because it seemed like they were finally turning a corner. You know, the, the, the cupboard had been restocked. There's a great pro, uh, prospect pool. Um, everybody in the organization has been talking about how deep it is and how excited they are to, you know, see the, the young players finally get their opportunity, and, and now he's gone. So, um, I don't know. It's a real head-scratcher. Sean, after a couple of days, where what are you thinking? Um, based off of what I've been, uh, hearing and sort of reading between the lines, I think it, it becomes more and more, uh, easier to, uh, to sort of decipher that it was more of a Linden decision to leave than an Aquilini decision to, uh, to part ways. Uh, I think that the fact that, uh, if you look at the past two times that Aquilini has, uh, moved on from a president or and or GM, he's had a replacement pretty quickly. It doesn't look like that that's uh, going to be the case this time. And I think we're going to see Jim Benning take a lot more of the, uh, the, the presidential roles going forward. And uh, as much as I would, when I was talking uh, the day of about uh, a quick hire, I don't think that's happening. And I think that, uh, uh, like I said, I think uh, Benning will uh, take over more of the pres- presidential roles. And I think if there is a hire that is to happen, it's going to be more of an advisor role. I would agree that's uh, likely the uh, plan going forward if there is uh, somebody new that comes in to that level of the organization. Um, I, I also agree uh, with Sean that uh, – I think that Francesco Aquilini would have preferred that Trevor Linden stay, even if they do have some sort of disagreement they have to work through. Um, you know, I think Trevor just adding it all up. He's got other interests outside of hockey. He has a, a young child. He uh, has taken a lot of uh, flack in the media for how things are not moving along very quickly, this and that. And then if you have a difficulty managing upward to your superior, I think that just it all comes to a head eventually. Yeah, I, yeah. I think like for for Trevor, I, I I mean, we mentioned in the intro, and it's been well documented the stuff that he has involved in. He that like I think what's getting lost is he, he actually doesn't need the job, does he? Like he doesn't no. really need to be the president of the Vancouver Canucks. Not in his own like like it's not required for him. He he can do whatever he wants. And he's, he can live with that, a life of luxury that many of us would envy. Mm-hmm. But oh, and, 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 yeah, Linda's going to be back, like off doing his own own thing with uh, back, probably back managing his his gyms and back on his bike and, and spending time with his kid. Like he'll he'll be fine. It's just it it's as. As I said on uh, the day of that, uh, it, and uh, uh, Tyler's reiterating here, it just looked like the the position wore on him, and the the amount of pressure that's on um, uh, Canadian hockey teams and the management with them is immense. And 
as as much as he was prepared uh, when he first took on the job, I don't think it. I don't think he realized um, the the position he actually was in in terms of being so sort the of intermediary between the fans, the GM, and the ownership. I, I also don't think he probably fully appreciated how much of a mess he was inheriting and how long it would take to uh, get back to competitiveness and. Uh, you know, maybe that first year they came in was a bit of a, you know, a bad thing. They made the playoffs. They got six games deep against the Calgary Flames. But it really kind of masked the fact that the team needed to undergo a rebuild, needed to get on with the rebuild. Uh, even John Tortorella on his way out famously described the roster as stale. And yet here they are in the playoffs their first year that they, they come in, right? So, you know, then reality sets in. And... You know, I can't believe that I'm agreeing with Jason Botford on something, but, uh, you know, his reaction that I, I listened to uh, was that maybe part of the disagreement that forced Trevor out was that, you know, the the Aquilinis are interested in seeing playoffs sooner, you know, like next year or two. And perhaps uh, Trevor Linden saw it uh, differently, saw maybe three, four years down the road before they're truly able to, you know, declare themselves, uh, you know, a playoff team and that that's the goal and that they intend to go deep in the playoffs and truly be competitive. I mean, the playoff word was thrown around in recent years, um, you know, because it really, I mean, at the start of the season, it, the goal for everybody is to win the Stanley cup. I mean, you say that you don't go into the season saying, well, we don't intend on making the playoffs, but um, as a realistic goal, Probably Trevor Linden didn't see the playoffs in the next year or two, and I don't think that's what the owners wanted to hear. Okay, so let, there's a couple things we need to unpack here. Mm-hmm. Okay, from the we had this conversation on Wednesday about the fan base, and there was a disconnect. I believe there's st- this disconnect between what Aquilini's vision is, I, I'm with you, and his desire to get into the playoffs, and a fan base that I think really does want the kids to play. The fan base on social media, as Sean put it, not the corporates. The corporate folks, I think, want this team in the playoffs. Is is kind of the the image I'm I'm seeing here. I I think the diehard, like, social media Vancouver Canuck fans say, okay, look, we'll watch these kids. And to back up that fact is how well the, uh, the that prospect camp was attended. That game was attended. It was really well attended and really well received. Uh, mm-hmm. I don't recall anything like that in previous years, but I could be wrong. But I think last year's was was quite well attended, uh, and I think a lot of it will. A lot of those that that game is is fantastic for showing sure the future. But uh, I think it all comes down to recency bias based off of that, and both last year and this year with the, the drafting of uh, Pedersen and Hughes really probably uh, helped that uh, help the sales uh, of those tickets. Yes, yeah, because there's something really exciting. Yeah. Well, and I, th- I think they're actually able to sell hope now. You know, if you go back three, four, five years, I don't, I don't think you could do that. But now with the uh, – how high they've been picking in the draft and, and you see all the great highlights of guys like a Pedersen and a Quinn Hughes. It, it, it's easier to sell the fans on the hope and they're getting on board with that. Okay. So how long from a fan base perspective can this team in a row miss the playoffs? Uh, well, what do you mean exactly? Like, like where can people this jump fan off base, good or? If, is, if Trevor Linden believes that this team is three, two, three or four years away from being a, a, a playoff team, can this van, fan base wait another four years for a playoff game? Well, I, I think they can. It's just, you know, how many empty seats does the owner have to look at in the meantime? Yeah, I, I agree with that. It's uh, it, the, the fan base, like, as we talked about on the, on the Wednesday – um, there's there's uh, definitely a bit of a, a split between uh, the two groups of fan base in the fan base. You've got the the season ticket holders, the the people who are shelling money out to uh, a lot of money out to get season tickets to um, be there 
as much as they can game in game out as opposed to the pro the 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 the, the more s- active social media fans for the most part who don't necessarily have the money to spend on that but still want to see the the team uh do well but they understand that the there is a pro a, a pro a process to to building up um i think the Looking at the empty seats will would would hurt, but I I do think that if if it the rebuild does end up taking three four or five years, by the time that happens, the when things get exciting again, the fans will be back. It's it's it just would be it would hurt the the owners the Aquilines pockets with the empty seats. You know, now maybe one of the feelings from ownership is. You know, if we get the 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 young, exciting players into the lineup now, instead of being as patient with them as the Canucks have been over the last number of years, even if there's a lot of losing hockey, at least there's some exciting hockey to watch. You know, like Brock Besser on a lot of nights last season was the only reason really to watch the Canucks play. You know, up until the last week when the Sedins announced their retirement and it was a celebration for them. But really, I mean, a lot of nights, I was finding myself as a fan mostly curious to how Brock Besser was doing and not much else, knowing that the playoffs were well out of reach. So I think that, you know, maybe the owner is willing. You know, there's that tweet there in his uh, string of 12 tweets where he talks about a rebuild being long, slow, and gradual, and everybody needs to be united behind the same vision and pulling in the same direction. Well, maybe his vision is get the kids in there now. There's lots of them. Find roster spots for them. And I don't know, uh, the approach that had been taken in Trevor Linden's time was to integrate them very slowly. And uh, yeah. I, I don't know, you know, that maybe that's where the conflict really starts. Oh, I think that there's there was definitely a conflict between them on how quickly to bring the kids along. I think there's definitely a good argument to be made um, to bring up at least one or two every year. Because if you're not selling success, you have to be selling hope. Mm-hmm. And if you're not doing either, then that's when things are bad. The thing about putting the kids in sooner rather than later, of course, is that it's a gamble. If they come in and they fail, then you've set yourself back even more. But um, you know, the, the ownership clearly is aware of what the the fan feeling is out there, and more fans than not want to see the the kids play. I mean, I think that's pretty clear. Yeah. Okay. So. You think for the fan base, this is going to be okay. It's it's going to be all right. Four years. That's mm-hmm. generally, generally you're all right with it? That's that's your perception? Well, I, I think at this point, 2011 so long ago now, that this idea of trying to, you know, rekindle that kind of a run, I mean, that that's so far in the past now. Uh, I mean, I think if you go back to when uh, John Tortorella was the coach that, that year, that's the uh, – uh, 13 14 season uh you know there was still a lot of the players from that run and a lot of great memories associated with those players and and you know so the the idea of letting all that go and and entering the rebuild phase is a harder thing for the fans to stomach but but we're well past that now yeah yeah uh, and i think that i think 3 years is the I think the the goal that the team should be looking at in terms of being at least a playoff team or at least competing for the playoffs. I think if they everything goes right, they could probably do it in two, but three and possibly waiting one more year to four is probably a, a more realistic uh, uh, approach to 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 plan for. Yeah, yeah I, I, I I don't think that saying uh, the 2019-20 season is the realistic target to be a playoff team. If, if that's what ownership thinks, then uh, they, I don't, I don't know what to say. Like, you know, we're, 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 they're well off from that. Yeah, I, and Like I said, I think everything has to go right to, to make that happen. You have to have Pedersen come in and have a, have a better type season as his rookie season and build on it. You have to have Quinn Hughes come in and, and be that – dynamic top four defenseman who can uh, build the build the play up from his own end and uh, get it into the offensive zone. You have to have uh, Markstrom 
and or Demko step up and become a, a bona fide number one de- a goalie. You have to have Horvat continue to, to develop. You have to have um, either Berchi or Dolan come in and actually be a, a healthy, consistent number one number one line uh, winger to go with the Horvat and the and the Besser and possibly the Pedersen. Like, there's so many. Um, what, like ifs that need to happen for that that to work. That it's the the chances are happening is low, but and they if the the ownership is can actually look at that and and Benning can maybe slow the slow the roll a bit. The three year plan should be what they should is should be what they look look at. I would add one more to that list there too. I think you need things to be going smoothly in Utica. So it, it, what I mean by that is uh, whichever of the players end up starting off the season there, yeah. they need to be having success at the minor league level and come the time for an injury replacement, they can you know, just seamlessly slide into the Canucks lineup with a lot of confidence. So there is a whole lot of ifs there. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Let's – this is going to be a little – controversial but I do and think that we need to have this conversation and the reason is 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 I never really thought about it Tyler until you brought it up but let's go back to the trade deadline and what happened at that time was Thomas Vanek was traded for a piece and and a not a drop pick they got Brendan Leipzig in a trade for Philip Holm it turns out to be a pretty great trade but the whole conversation around that was, where's the draft picks, where's the draft picks, where's the draft picks. Jim Benning has a press conference, and the Vancouver media is pretty much all over them is trying to, like, hey, did you ask this? Did you ask that? Botchford was one of them that was pretty heavy on that. Elliot Friedman goes on a Vancouver radio station. He says, you know what? I can completely understand if I was Jim Benny and if I was Trevor Linden, how I would feel, how hard this is to be dealing with this in this Vancouver market. He took a hell of a lot of heat for it because there were some fans that was like, yeah, meh, maybe. But a lot of other fans were like, look, tough crap. This is the way that it is. If you're in this market, yeah, this media is tough, but there's, it's tougher in other places. So this leads me to two questions here. Because this hasn't really been talked about a lot in this conversation. A couple of people brought it up. You brought it up. The media pressure of, of working in this market, number one. And number two, I'm going to ask the same question. Would this Vancouver media market be okay with a four-year missing of the playoffs? Or would they be far too harsh on this team? I think we've seen to date that uh, they're not very patient. You know, I, uh, I mean, and some of that I would say goes back to just the fact that this organization has never had a Stanley Cup. You know, if there was one, it'd be easier, I think, for people to take a chill pill and relax and let things be. But it's uh, there's a there's there's a lot of angst. There's a lot of there's a lot of get on with it. You know, that's why there's always these calls like you know, go scorched earth. For, you know, drop the bomb, get get the rebuild going. Let's get it, you know, let's get it going. Let's get it finished as quickly as possible because people have been waiting a long time to uh, see that Stanley Cup. So uh, I, I don't know. I uh, Like, it's hard to sell the media that the team is progressing when they're not moving up the standings very much. And that's kind of what's been happening, right? Like, I, I look at the team, and I, I look at last year as – a progression from the year before, but I mean, really they didn't move that far up the standings moved up a little bit, went on a surge in the final week there, but I mean, really they they didn't get much closer to a playoff spot. Yeah. I think it's, it's taught. I think, well, there, I think there's, there's two factors in that, whether or not the media will be able to take it. One, I think, we have a bit of a, uh, a media war in Vancouver now with the uh, with Sportsnet coming in, taking the, the Canucks rights and um, sort of relegating the TSN crew to being the 
well, I don't want to say relegating, but allowing the TSN crew to be a little more critical, be a little more uh, just like ra- like not being afraid to piss off the 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 team that that is giving them the most money for the broadcast rights. So I think there's no matter how the Canucks are doing, the the media landscape in Vancouver has changed enough that you're still going to see. A lot of criti- a lot of critical uh, takes, um, unless they're just outright winning every game, which is uh, pretty much impossible. Yeah, so, the only thing that the only thing that would mitigate losses would be, like I mentioned before, having somebody really exciting. You know, like a guy that's on the highlight reel every night that gives some something to attach themselves to. That's uh, that's positive to talk about. Yeah, if if we get happen to get like lucky and, and see the uh, the Bester Pedersen Horvat power play come in and just rip it up even and even if that me even if that the Canucks aren't aren't winning and they're still a sort of a bottom ten team, I think that would be good enough to uh, to stave the wolves off enough that uh, we would uh, you you'd be selling enough hope that uh, people would keep coming back just to watch that. It is interesting to observe specifically on this that the language that I am, this is just my observation, but the language I'm hearing on SportsCenter about this and the language that I'm hearing in TSN about this has been completely different. TSN is kind of focused on that press conference, that teleconference, whatever you want to call it. And that was the footage I got was was from TSN. Sportsnet has asked some different questions. Do we need a president of hockey? We'll, we'll get into that actual question here in a second. But do we need a president of hockey operations? What specifically was Trevor Linden's role with the team? Uh, like they haven't, Sportsnet hasn't necessarily, and I'm just, I'm, I'm not saying one way is right or wrong. I'm just being observant. I'm just observing here. But Spurs hasn't exactly attacked the Canucks, and it's a probably understandable because they're the rights holder. I think that that has, has a lot to do with it. But TSN has been on full critical mode here. Like, and it is just interesting to me to to hear, like, the different pers- – it's it's almost night and day when you kind of listen to one or the other. One's like, okay, let's, let's have a – let's really look at this, and I feel like TSN is like, ah – Let's let's slash and challenge this a little bit. And I'm not saying one way is the right way or the other way, but I think that that I can see this where let's get back to the beginning here, what Tyler talked about. I think that this was completely has, how can this not wear on Trevor Linden in some way or shape or form? Like one day you're dealing with your broadcast right holder that it's and you're they're asking questions. And on the other hand of this, you're getting your former rights holder, and you're not getting necessarily the same questions. It's a it's a different relationship. Like, mm-hmm. Well, and and the rights changed during Trevor Linden's time as well. And also, there there's there's got to be a degree of friction there, where uh, yeah, you know, the team went over to Sportsnet, and that's probably because it was friendlier coverage, and they already had that relationship on the television side, and. You know, that's just another layer to it. Yeah, I agree. I, I mean, neither approach is particularly wrong or, or right. Um, you know, you, you ask the question, you know, what is the, what is, what was Trevor Linden's role? Well, we don't know. I mean, it's, there's no publicly published, you know, job description. Uh, if you're, you know, some, you know, the owner of a, of a big company or the owner of a pro sports franchise and, uh, you know, the, the, the top executive, uh, has the role, has the title president or president of hockey operations, whatever they have for a title is just something that's meant to make them sound good, you know, but really the, the role is whatever the owner wants it to be. And we just don't know exactly what that was. I mean, I, obviously if you put the three guys on an org chart, Francesco Aquilini first, Trevor Linden second, Jim Benning third. So Trevor's got, he's that in between, he's that buffer for, for, uh, between the guy that's uh, making the uh, day-to-day decisions and ownership. But, you know, does, does ownership want Trevor to basically implement all of 
ownership's wishes or does ownership want Trevor to bring ownership recommendations? You know, how much of a degree is there rubber stamping going on on big decisions? We just, we just don't know any of that. Well, one of the things that Brian Burke said this week that I thought was quite interesting was the whole, he talked about what his role was in Calgary, which was basically he would take pretty much 50 or 60 speaking engagements that was required at Tree Living and he would do them. So he would be sort of the public face of the flames in the corporate world. Now, sidebar, there was a couple of times that Brian Burke completely slipped up in that role, and that's a different topic for another time. But that was, but but specifically, that's what Brian Burke was required to do. He was also there at the time when, you know, if there was a potentially – an off, a trade that he didn't necessarily like, he would he would not necess, he would he would override that. And I the, the debate on what the actual role, what seems to be president the title was president of hockey operations, I don't necessarily think was is is a bad role. I think maybe the difference between what Burke was doing and what Linden was doing, and I can see why you would want Trevor. Of course, there's no question why you would want not want Trevor Linden in front doing 60 public speaking engagements and not Jim Benning. They're just different people, right? So Benning's not like Benning's not as a, a stronger public orator as Trevor Linden is, and you know a, Burke was more well known than Tree. So in terms of comparison, there and. That's that's fine, but did, did Trevor Linden necessarily have hockey knowledge to say yes or no on certain moves? I guess is is a question for another time. But I would suggest you still need the role, and I would suggest what Trevor Linden offered was was quite valuable. Well, I would hope that they still have a go between the general manager and the owner because I think what we saw when we didn't have that with Mike Gillis was a lot of knee jerk reactions to fan and media pressure. Um, and I mean, you can kind of see, you can kind of see how, how that could be. You have the owner feeling the heat from the public and his, his number two is the general manager that makes the decisions. And, you know, they made some, some odd decisions. You know, you go back to goaltending and uh, the Hodgson trade with uh, Zach Cassie, and I mean a lot of a lot, a lot of those decisions I felt were kind of knee jerk reacting to public pressure, and it seemed like under the the, the Lyndon Benning setup, they were less prone to knee jerk reactions to public and media pressure. I I think it was more of a I don't think it was like what Gillis did was more was knee jerk in terms of media and and fans. I think it was more just he made one gigantic mistake to try and become bigger and stronger because they lost the Bruins as opposed to going what was the actual direction of, of hockey, which was faster and more skilled. Yeah, um, I def- definitely agree on that part. Yeah. And he, he even copped out to that when he got let go was he was – it had he been given more leash, that's the direction he would have gone. Um, with Benning and Linden, whether or not they caught they uh, bent to media and fan pressure, I, I think is irrelevant because no matter when you talk, when the media talked with Linden versus Benning, there was always some sort of mixed message. You didn't quite understand what the actual direction of the organization organization was, um, and I think that is because as that partnership grew um, since uh, Lennon brought it, brought in Benning, I think they actually parted ways in terms of what they thought the actual direction was. You had Lyndon, who I. Th- from all the reports, sounds like he was the more patient one who was willing to wait it out with another, like that, the three to four years, while Benning was more on the Aquilini side where to push for the, 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 the playoffs in one to two years, which really hurt uh, how, how probably the team was uh, 
perceived by other teams in negotiating negotiations. Yeah, there's certainly that perception there that that maybe one of the two wanted it faster, you know, than the other. I, I'm not sure that Trevor Linden and Jim Benning were on different pages as much as ownership and, and the people below the management team. But um, yeah, it would have been helpful if they were, you know, got their messaging in line. I think some of that just comes down to the fact that neither was really particularly comfortable having to explain things to the media. Um, so, that, so that's number one. Uh, the other thing is too, of course, the general manager is closer to the actual on ice product. There is just more built in, uh, urgency to see a winning product than from the president's position. So I, I, I don't know, you know, that, that's one of these things that's just never going to be explained. Uh, but I, I don't, I don't know. I mean, I, I think that, uh, both Trevor Linden and, and Jim Benning did favor, uh, having veteran presence and the more veteran presence you have means the, the, the less opportunities for the younger players to learn on the fly and, you know, how fast is that rebuild going to happen if they're not learning on the fly? You know, it all kind of goes together, I guess. So a couple, a couple of other things I'm, I'm going to get tackled here in a second, but you know, there, there's, there's three guys that I actually legitimately am starting to really feel bad for Jay Beagle, Antoine Roussel and Tim Schaller. These three guys have not played a single game in a Vancouver Canuck jersey. And they're coming into this Hornets desk where I, I think that the fan base is not happy that these guys have been signed for this length of a contract. Specifically, I think the one that's getting the hardest is, is Be- getting it the hardest is Beagle. Roussel not so much, but, and Schaller not so much. But Beagle's getting this really hard. And he's kind of walking into a Hornets desk. If I, I was thinking about this, is if I was Jay Beagle, I, I'd find that I'd, I'd make sure that you have that limited no move, and I'd almost want to run. Like, what would you do if you're Jay Beagle? Like, other than obviously be a pro, but what, like, like what must Jay Beagle be thinking right now? Well, he's got to be concerned, but uh, he's committed now. He is. He can't change his mind. I I think you got to be a little tough, thick skinned in, in in this where you're as a player you sign on for the organization and first and the fans second. As as weird as that may sound to some, because you're not signing on for the to a to a team for the loud social media fans who are going to either love the what like any move or hate it because in 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 today's world especially with how people are expressing their views that there is no there there's a a very very quiet minority middle ground group as and then everyone else seems to be taking a hard line stance, whether it's love the move, hate the move, or whatever. So I think you have to, as a as a player, be very thick skinned in in terms of dealing with the the media who are the conduit that these the fans go through, um, versus who uh, who the 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 vision that is the that they signed on for that the the organization, the management has uh, portrayed to them. I mean, hopefully, in the case of Jay Beagle, he comes in fresh off a, a Stanley Cup win and uh, embraces the opportunity to uh, be a mentor. And uh, he's going to come in with a lot of credibility, obviously. And hopefully uh, he gets the younger players buying into what he's uh, putting down for them and things start to move in the right direction. But... Um, yeah, right now it's just I think any player has to wonder when there's a change at the top of what uh, might be coming next for changes. Yeah, I think there's also a little bit of the again some of the information that's come out in the last couple of days that uh, when Benning signed his uh, his extension back in the spring, he after he 
signed that extension, he basically was reporting to Admiral Lee directly, and Lyndon was wasn't uh, the the intermediary between those two anymore. So uh, you would you would hope that uh, those players and their agents were aware of that beforehand, and this this move isn't as as big a a shock to the system as it potentially could be. That's that's a very good point. I mean, I I, I would imagine agents have all of those dynamics figured out and presented to presented to their clients before they sign on the dotted line. Yeah, yeah. There's, there's probably a lot going on there. So bef- before we get to Aquilini, so let's get your opinion. Do you, we we do agree there at ne- least needs to be an advisor. Uh, the name Dean Lombardi came up, to, but um, looks like that's going to be a hard one because of his contract with the Flyers. Uh, from what I was reading, that looks like there's some sort of block there. I'll just pull up. Uh, yeah, that was uh, Elliot Friedman that floated that name out there as a possibility. And then today, he, uh, after digging into that a little bit further, apparently uh, uh, Lombardi has a three-year contract with the Flyers, or, or a contract with the Flyers, but no out clauses for three years. So he's pretty committed to, to Philadelphia at this time. Uh, but a, a, a guy like Dean Lombardi, you could see being uh, uh, what – ownership would be looking for a guy that that's been there done that has that Stanley Cup credibility to come into the organization I mean that's the type of guy that I, I would think they're looking for yeah I agree they 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 want I think they're, they're definitely going to be looking for someone with experience someone who's been there done that like you said has the ring and has the ring as a GM or a president beforehand not someone who has a has a ring as an assistant GM like Benning or something similar like that. They, I think, if they are going to bring in someone, they are definitely going to be looking for some someone who has experience at that level um, and has success. Uh, the other name that was uh, mentioned uh, uh, the other day was Chris Pronger, and I, I mean, I just can't see him wanting to come to Vancouver. So even if that uh, was uh, an idea being pursued, I, I I just don't see that as realistic. Yeah, plus and, Kevin would hate it. So. Oh, this uh, it, as I said, Tyler, if his name was Chris Off <laughs> Pronger Off, our view, our view of, of him would be much different. I I just don't. I've never been a fan of how this. I've never liked how he's played. Um, I think he's one of the dirtiest players to ever play this game. I've never understood the respect for how this guy has played and the respect that he's gotten. Uh, I'm not going to dispute how a huge impact that he had on the Oilers and the Ducks over the years, but I've never been a huge fan of this guy. And I don't know, quite frankly, I think there's some valid questions of him as a human being, which in comparison to what has been lost here, I think is a fair question. But if I I think we would be looking at, if his name was Chris Off Prongeroff, if he was from a different nationality, this guy would be looked upon a lot differently than he is right now. Oh, I, I mean, I'm with you. I, I, I think Chris Pronger was one of the dirtiest players uh, ever, uh, certainly uh, near the top of the list in his time. You know, you're asking why he gets so much respect. I, mean, I brought this up the last time I was on the podcast, and that is he's an Ontario guy. Yeah. You know, like, I, like, they, they, they all, like when does an Ontario guy ever come under fire from the, the national media? I mean, it's like never pretty much. Yeah. So I would look to that. Yeah. Uh, in terms, yeah, Chris Pronger, Ryan Johnson's name. I heard Ryan Johnson's name be bandied about. Uh, Ken Holland's name was being bandied about, but he he signed on with Detroit. Brian Burke was asked, and he said no. Uh, he's not doing it, not because he doesn't. Well, I, I think him and and Aquilini, his words, he doesn't feel that Aquilini's like him. I I don't know the whole story there. Uh, it's. It's going to be a really hard replacement in my mind, and I don't think it's something that they necessarily have to rush into, do they? Or no, I think they need to take their time and find the right fit. Um, as I said off the bat, uh, I think this took uh, Francesco uh, a little 
a little off putting for him because I, if you look at how he's, how he's acted, uh, in the past with the firing of, of Dave Nonis and immediately Mike Gillis steps in. And then same thing. The firing of Mike Gillis was done by Lyndon, but Lyndon was there to, to be, to be the guy that uh, carried the Canucks on to the next, the next chapter. Um, and I don't think that, uh, 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 Francesco was expecting, expecting this and wasn't prepared. So I think the, the talk about Lombardi, I think was probably true until, um, the actual terms of his uh, deal with Philly came out and, uh, and that was, just, I think that was more Francesco sort of, uh, uh, kicking the tires on, on someone who we thought would have been a, uh, a, a very good, uh, a replacement or someone to bring in to the fold in whatever, uh, role that he, he, uh, wanted. I, I would also, uh, say that there's no rush really to, uh, figure out, uh, who should fill that position. Or in whatever shape it's going to be. I mean, most of the off-season work has been done. They've gotten through the draft and the early part of free agency, and uh, they just did the Jake Vertanen deal. So there, there isn't really uh, a lot of heavy lifting left to do that the, the replacement would need to be involved in right away. I would, um, uh, personally, I mean, I would like to see them have it figured out before the season starts, just so that's no longer a a distraction and that would hopefully take a, a little bit of uh, heat off of off of Jim Benning to start the season and uh you know all the expectations I mean he's he's on the hot seat for sure and it got much warmer after the news the other day yeah uh, yeah certainly and I, I mean I guess that's yeah going forward how what's I, I think people are going to be looking at things through this Benny Linden lens depending on that perspective as well. I, I think it's going to be, it's that, that will be interesting going forward. Um, that, that part will be interesting. I'm trying to, was going through some names and I can't really think of anybody that really jumps out at me. That would be like, Hmm. I mean, I, I was like, so here's some of the names that popped in my head and I, I've already knocked them out. I'll, I'll knock them out and I'll tell you why. Daryl Sutter was never a good general manager, president type of person. He's a better coach. Yeah, uh, agreed Alan, on that. Alan Vigneault is a coach. Uh, he's never been in a higher position, but that was another guy that popped up. Another guy that popped in my head and I just I don't think he'll ever leave us is, is Cam Neely. But... That would be an interesting hire, but it's right now. I don't think you're going to get the guy that you need to do that, or the person you need really to. And that's why I think there's no no rush. And even if it is halfway through the next season, they they need to make the right hire on what a, like whatever role it is, advisor, president, or whatever whatever that that title is. They need to make sure that whoever they bring in next is the the right hire. And not rushing into it, I think, is the smart move. Yeah. Like, as I said, even if, as much as we, we would, would like to see it happen before the beginning of the season, I wouldn't be too upset as long as, long as they get the right hire in if it takes longer. Well, just one thing to note on that as far as some urgency is that uh, if indeed there's going to be a, an expansion team in Seattle in the near future, uh, you know, they're going to be building their front office as well. So you have a bit of competition to contend with that actually isn't even in the league right now. Yeah, that's true as well. Uh, and they've already got Dave Tippett there. I don't know what his role, they haven't outlined what his role is, but he's there and kind of signed on. So yeah, that that's also going to be, to be interesting as well. And you know, after the success of what George McPhee did in Las Vegas, I think, Yes, the rules are certainly not – that's a future conversation if it was the rules or if it was George McPhee. But I think someone else is going to want to see if they can do what George McPhee did in, in Seattle, what they did in Vegas. I don't think uh, – I'll, I'll throw out a name that, I, that I've heard mentioned. And I mean, I don't see him being interested in the job whatsoever. But uh, what do you guys think of uh, Ray Ferraro as a possibility? 
that's going down the same rabbit hole that the the Linden hire was. Uh, I think it's yeah. I I think Ray Ferrar would be a fantastic hire as an assistant GM, uh, someone to grow through the through the system. Let uh, let him learn uh, the intricacies of that of uh, what it takes to be a man in the front office in the NHL, but not someone you throw in as a as a president. So maybe if this was an advisor role, that would be something that would be uh, I'd be interested in, but uh, not as a if you as a quote unquote president. I just I. I mean, I think I know why people love Ray Ferraro as an analyst because he's an excellent analyst. I just didn't. I don't know where this came from that he would be a great president. Like, I'm not sure I, where that came from. Well, I, I, I think just the idea, the suggestion of his name, I think, is just simply that he, he's based in Vancouver. He, you know, he, he sounds very knowledgeable. I mean, I mean, we're we're here struggling to come up with some names, so it, you know that you can see why. Just based on location, uh, that one would be suggested. He's a BC guy, but he, I don't know. I've never gotten much sense from him whenever he talks about the Canucks, um, that he's, you know, much of a, a fan of the team whatsoever and, and would have any interest in that kind of role. I think he seems very comfortable in what he's doing now. So, yeah, uh, I don't know. I just wanted to, I just wanted to bring that one up because you brought up a couple other names that were quite interesting, but, but really not realistic either. Yeah, that's fair. I well, I mean, the, I, the ideal candidate was hired by the Leafs about uh, three months ago in, in Lawrence Gilman. Yeah, that's true. That is true. I think that, that yeah, would... and, and probably a guy that Francesco Aquilini still has a lot of respect for, I would think. And 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 someone who who loves the Vancouver area, he still lived there for after he was he was let go, so. Mm-hmm. I, I I mean I don't know you know that I, I I wouldn't keep that I wouldn't say that that name is necessarily I know he's signed by Toronto and I'm not trying to cause any friction here but to the Toronto folk but I I, I wouldn't necessarily I I think that that's more of a realistic expectation than Ferraro I know that he's already signed but he he, he does I think... love it out here. I think that's a long term. If the if the Canucks can get through the next year, year and a half without a quote unquote president, and maybe they bring in a Ferraro type, someone who's maybe in the media or someone who a, a fresh someone with a fresh outlook, and then maybe you bring in Gilman, especially come year and a, year and a half to two years later when you would be looking at. Uh, at being a little closer, closer to the cap, and and that was that's Gilman's uh, forte is is working the cap. You look at what he did for the Gil, the Gillis regime in terms of working the cap to and and keeping the Canucks cap compliant, but still paying more than the cap. It was it was genius. So I think that, and plus he just signed, like I said, he just signed on with Toronto, so. I wouldn't. I don't see him as being someone who would sign on and then, and then move on from that so quickly just because another opportunity presented himself. I it presented itself. I think he would be definitely someone who would uh, go headfirst into a into a job and then stick it out at least for a significant amount of time before looking for looking elsewhere. What about? What's the perception on John Garrett? No. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I know Ray Ferraro is well respected. I mean, just, there's the other guy who wants to put ketchup on. That this is that's a no. Well, I, I, I think love it, the guy. I've yeah. met him. I love the guy, but not in this role. Well, I think if you're looking for a fresh perspective, he's he's too close to the team to to say that there's a you know, like a, a fresh face being added there. I mean, he covers the team day in and day out, flies with the team on road trips. I, I just, yeah. I, <laughs> I mean, it's, it's, it's just funny to think of uh, of him in that role, uh, just knowing his personality. But, uh, yeah, I, 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 even if he was interested in it and, and there was ownership was serious about it, I, uh, 
and I'll roll with that one. I he he's not in. I I would be very surprised if he's interested in that either. Yeah. Uh, but that that being said, the uh, the TV the TV clips of hit the the cutaways of him going up in the up in the uh, the uh, the, man, the 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 press box with eating eating fries watching the game would be would be hilarious. That would be amusing. Yeah, <laughs> be amusing. Let let's end with this question because I think we've. I understand. There's there's been a lot of perspectives about this. We started with, you know, we started this podcast off. Of, you know, normally you have a press conference, and normally you you have a guy that sits in front of the media and answers the question specifically if the it's the owner. What happens here is is we get the GM and the head coach doing a conference call, and we still haven't heard other than the thirteen tweets from from the owner here. He doesn't go in front of the media. I what what do you think of the ownership of this team? Like if there was someone other millionaire that walked into the Aquilini's door and said, I'm gonna buy this team outright from you. Would you be happy about this, or would you be sad about it? I I think there it all depends on who that person is. If they're a more of a quote unquote traditional owner, where they sort of just like set a budget, and as long as you stay within that budget, they're happy. I think that might be a bit of a, an upgrade, but I think the the passion that the Aquilini's bring to wanting to be successful. I think that's, that's, that's something that uh, people are, are misconstruing and, and getting upset over, even though they they just want the best for the, the team. So it's, it's, it's a lot better than having Eugene Melnick as an owner. So, yeah, I, I'm kind of indifferent on ownership. I, I, I think as long as they have the deep pockets and are, are willing to endure periods of, of empty seats, um, you know, and, and willing to, to, you know, having a, I guess, willing to really care about the wins and losses, you know, I, I think those things are important. But, yeah, you know, they, that's separate from keeping your hands off and, you know, uh, Hiring, you know, hiring the, the 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 right people and letting them do their job, and what we just haven't ever really been able to figure out with any certainty in the the time that the Aquilinis have owned the team is how hands off are they? You know, we know that they're not entirely hands off. We just don't know to what extent that they are are meddling. You know, um, and clearly from the Francesco's Aquilini's use of Twitter, he. He has a lot to say about various signings and draft picks and this and that. And, you know, maybe it's just to try and uh, give the fans this sense of uh, unity within. But this is clearly not a style of ownership where the owner just rubber stamps everything that his people suggest to him. Uh, so I I don't know. I mean, I, I think if, uh, if there was a change in ownership, I think it would be mostly applauded for sure from the fan base. I think people are looking for a change there because there's been so many changes in the other positions, coach, general manager, president. But um, I, I don't have strong feelings either way on, on ownership. And, and I don't blame um, – I don't – I'm not really particularly – uh, surprised that uh, the owner would be in hiding. You know, a lot of there's a lot of there's a lot of uh, pro sports owners that uh, stay out of the media spotlight. They uh, they may be good in business, but they may not be that great with a bunch of cameras in front of them. And uh, I think in this case, clearly, uh, the Aquilini's figured that there was more harm to be done by getting in front of the cameras and facing a hostile press conference uh, than the other. You know, than the alternative. So I. It's a bit of a calculated move to hide behind a statement and some tweets, but um, when you know when or if there is a replacement, I'm sure we'll we'll see the owner come out at that time. See, I, I actually disagree with you. I, I think I think he should have he should have been in front of the camera. I think well, I think he should have been too. I, I just I can I can see why they they would feel like that was a risky idea. Yeah, like. We are the Canucks already have someone who you put in front of the camera and he says 
stupid things or says things in a stupid way in, in Venice. And Francesco, every time he's been in front of the camera, it comes across as, across as quite quiet and, and shy. So I, I, I agree with, with Tyler in, in the fact that I understand why he didn't uh, uh, put himself in front of the camera. But I, I, I do think that uh, this is the one when you have a, a change in a hockey ops president, you need to put, put yourself in front of the camera, even if you don't want to. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. From an accountability point of view, this looks really weak, Kevin. But uh, uh, I get, and they, and they, I'm sure they know that. But again, it just if they if they figure that there there is. Uh, you know, things are going to get worse by him being out in front of the cameras and looking flustered and not having very good answers and getting eaten alive by the media. Uh, then, you know, that would explain why, why they've taken the route that they've taken. Well, there's a, there is the theory that as August rolls along, this, this story is going to eventually die. We're going to get into training camps. We're going to start focusing on other things. And this really won't be that big of a deal. Well, there'll be actual on on ice things to talk about by then. Yeah, yeah. I think once once training camp starts, the this will be on the back burner. But it that's still six weeks away. So yeah, that's still a lot, 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 a lot of time for uh, the hockey media in Canada and Vancouver specifically to chew on this and do some more digging. So you know, that's that's a bit of a worry. It's interesting that this hasn't really been a huge national media story, though, this week. Is it? Is it? I, I don't it's know. Va- it's, it's Vancouver. It's, Va- it's like specifically they- a Vancouver media. But this wasn't, you know, this, like, uh, following the national networks have been still focused on the Raptors. There was the conversation around Johnny Manziel and whether he should have played or not. He got some play. Uh, but the this Linden story hasn't it hasn't hit in a national level. Yeah, I mean, I, I I'm with Sean. I mean, it's it, if this was happening in Toronto, I mean, I mean, you, you, it's obvious what the coverage would be like. Um, but you know, for the two networks, if we want to just focus on Sportsnet and TSN for a second. I mean, Sportsnet's got you know with the Blue Jays and that non waiver trade deadline approaching, and there's all this speculation around who's moving and and, and such. So they've got that. To focus on uh, TSN's got the CFL to focus on. There was the Johnny Manziel speculation, uh, you know. So yeah, there, there's only so much uh, airtime that they're going to devote to something that's not Toronto. And and uh, you know, Kevin, I heard your comments there the other day about uh, the whole De- Demar Derozan thing. Like I, I'm I'm so fed up with the Demar Derozan coverage. Like uh, you know, not to get on a big t- tangent here, but like it, it was like the trade was a week and a half ago. Like it's, it's time to move on from it now for yeah. both for DeRozan and for the media, like let it go. It's over. with. And and they're still talking about it. I mean, they were interviewing Kyle Lowry today and it's still, it's still big news. And it's just, it's, it's quite something. Mm-hmm. And I mean, one of these days I, I'm going to make this call out. I want someone in the Toronto media landscape to come on this with me on this podcast to explain how this works, because I honestly don't get it. Like, I honestly don't get how Kyle Lowry is a bigger story than Trevor Linden, and quite frankly, a bigger story than Jerome Ginla. Uh, I I, I I don't think there's much to explain. I mean, the market's the biggest Obvi, yeah. market, market, and that, that's, uh, you know, so that's the biggest portion of people that would be interested in things Toronto, and they just... The, the other part of it too is that logistically Toronto things are easier for them to cover, so they they just they take that route. Yeah, that's why I, I'm sure that that's true, but I, I I just don't believe I don't believe the Toronto Raptors are a national popularity. I think if you looked at the I mean, we're getting on a tangent here, but in terms of NBA, I don't like if you took the Raptors in terms of a graph of all across Canada, I don't think that. The na- the national narrative of NBA fans in Canada are necessarily Raptor fans. You no, know, I, I think you could say the Blue Jays have more of a natu- uh, national reach than the Raptors do. Yeah, absolutely. And even that, and even that, I would I wouldn't even even say that's a a, na- a national reach. You get out you get out to 
BC and, and the lower mainland specifically. And there's, it's a lot, it's Mariners. Yeah. Um, Alberta, Saskatchewan. Yeah. There's probably more, more Jays fans, but I would say there's a lot, a lot, uh, a lot more uh, fans of other teams and, and all that. And the same with the NBA. It's just, just mm-hmm. because it's the only, the only, the only uh, team in, in Canada doesn't mean it's Canada's team. Yeah. 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 Cause you, you look at it. If Toronto gets an NFL team, it would be the same thing. They would treat, treat it as Canada's team, but you, you have so many people who are, 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 have, uh, put allegiances into other teams that it's not, it wouldn't be the truth, but that's the way they want. That's the way they would want to sell it. And that's the way that uh, they would sell it. So it's a a bit of Toronto centric, but as well as, well, it's the only Canadian team. So we must cover it as a national story with, with the Raptors and, and the Jays. So, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and yeah, it's it's interesting. I mean, in the Manziel story, I, I wasn't going to get into it, but to me, because I, I know Tyler was following this as well. We'll quickly. I just want to quickly touch in on this. To me, in my opinion, we want to talk about a PR disaster, not necessarily a PR mistake, a P, not a PR disaster, but a PR mistake. I think the Montreal Alouettes, I think, own some culpability to this for telling the fans that there was a possibility that Johnny Manziel was going to play, even though he had one practice. But the other group that I think is, is it needs to be a little bit responsible here is the Canadian football league, because they actually tweeted that there was a possibility that this guy was going to play on last night. And uh, to expect anybody to play after one practice is just completely unreasonable but if I was a fan and I was told that we were going to see Johnny Manziel and I bought a ticket to see Johnny Manziel, man, I would be ticked. Oh, yeah. No, there was no doubt that the crowd there in Montreal last night was bigger because of the potential of seeing him play. I, I, I mean, I, if I were an LOS fan, I mean, I would feel lied to. I was watching last night hoping to see him play, and I, you know, I wasn't entirely surprised that he didn't play, but it was disappointing. There's no other way to put it. Yeah. Yeah. And I think it's disappointing on, on the side of it. I, I feel for a guy like Mike Riley who threw for 400 yards and he's still not even the spot of the game. <laughs> it's just crazy, eh? Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, we had to, I just, we had to cover that. Uh, anything else we need to talk about? I think there's, there's one thing that I wanted to touch on. Sure. And that was within, in that, uh, in that teleconference, uh, Benning did mention the, that uh, the offense is coming from the likes of Horvat, Besser, Berchi, Leipzig, and Goldobin. And he said, we'll have to see where Pedersen is at camp. So mm. I think one thing that is a bit of a, a bright light in terms of this is that despite what people are thinking in terms of um, this becoming more of a veteran team, it still looks like the kids, the skilled, the skilled kids are still going to be the, the focal point of the offense. And I think for people who are, were worried that gold open was an afterthought. I don't think he is. Yeah, that was definitely encouraging to hear. And, uh, you know, it would, it would, it would be wrong for him to not put a little qualifier on Pedersen there. I mean, they, they, yeah, they want to, keep the hype machine under control a little bit with him. And I, I thought that that was prudent, but great, great to hear the the name gold open and great to hear for me. I think the name Leipzig, I, I liked what I saw there when he came to the team last year and uh, they still seem to be big believers in him. So that's, uh, that's also good to hear. But yeah, yeah. It, you didn't hear the name for Tannen. Well, I, I think for Tannen's more of a, a guy who needs to prove that he can actually provide offense. Because I don't think he has, and like, if you look at that that group that was named outside of Leipzig, they've all they've all shown an app, like a, an inability to score and have the skill to score at the NHL level consistently. Um, while Vertanen hasn't yet, 
And maybe that's maybe that maybe that was a calculated move by Benning too, in terms of uh, continuing to light a fire under under Vertanen to have him force his way into the top six. Yeah, which maybe. would be fantastic. Maybe, maybe it'd be a huge boost if he were able to do that. Yeah, yeah. If that back to the back to the ifs from earlier, if the the likes of Vertanen and Hulevi can can step up and and play like the the players that uh, the Canucks were hoping they were when they drafted them so high, that would go a long way into um, into speeding up the rebuild and uh, getting the Canucks into that uh, into the playoff uh, discussion at the very least within the next year or two. But as we as we said earlier, there's way too many ifs for that to to be a, a realistic. Uh, idea to to me i still i mean it just didn't get with everything else that happened on the signing of Bertan a couple of days ago it was just how that was worded is is and even benning's kind of stuck with it in in the in the conference call too is they still it was almost like like we're going to give you this contract but we still have some reservations about you and it's almost it, it's almost like this is your last shot, it, like in in a lot of ways. Like I think, I, I I think I don't. I mean, I think that the way that they're wording this with Vertanen is is they're seeing some steps in some ways, but I still think I still think there's some they're not as sold on him yet overall. Mm-hmm. As they should, they they shouldn't be sold on him because he hasn't proven that he he can be more than just a uh, uh, an inconsistent bottom six player at this point. Like the last last little bit of last season, he started to show better, and hopefully he can continue that into next season. But at this point, he's still too inconsistent to be relied upon to be more than just a a third liner at best. Yeah. All right, well, let's leave it there. Uh, the next time I will be on I'm, is uh, Monday, of course, is a big day for the Calgary Flames and their fans as Jerome McGinley will announce his retirement. I have a funny hunch that we might see the third jerseys there. I'm just having that feeling. I could be wrong, but it's going to be a very interesting day. So we'll do a retrospective on that on Monday. That will be Episode 7. Sean, Tyler, how do we follow you on Twitter? I am Beardy Canuck 03. All right. I'm Tyler. And I'm at T Noble, T N O B L E. Very simple to remember. Cool. And of course, you can follow me, K E V O L E, Podcast Hockey, uh, SoundCloud.com, Spreaker, YouTube, Facebook, etc. Thanks, guys. We will talk to you all very soon. Bye for now.